What's good YouTube? Welcome back. Thank you for clicking onto this reaction. I hope you're looking forward to it just as much as I am. If you haven't already, head over to the content creators page. That link is in the description box down below. If you haven't already and you're enjoying our content, you know what you need to do. You need to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, but we're gonna jump straight into this one. Organized horde overwhelming its foes through sheer numbers. This could not be further from reality. The army of the Great Khans was a well-disciplined and strictly organized host, mm -hmm. with a level of complexity which was part of the key to Mongol military successes around Eurasia. In this video, we will discuss the structure of the Mongol army and how it contributed to their dominance over their enemies. We're happy to present so, the sponsor of this video. Just quickly, I'm going to skip the ads, but also, um, I know that they were they were grouped into 10, 10 men per squad and the men got to choose their leader didn't they and it was sort of the leader was chosen by the men and if one man um retreated they would all be executed as well so i know that that's part of the structure and that's absolutely savage it just shows you what the mongols are really willing to do most turkic and mongolic nomadic armies of the great eurasian steppe were organized through the decimal system, dating back to the time of the Xiongnu. In this system, warriors were grouped in multiples of 10, okay. 100, 1000, up to 10,000. These divisions were kept within tribal lines. Men from one tribe would not make up a decimal unit with men from another tribe. It was the innovation of Chinggis Khan during his unification of the Mongols to largely break down these tribal ties. Okay, yeah, I was going to say I thought that was the case, but it was only Genghis Khan who, who made that change. Before that, they all stayed within their sort of tribe, which was quite interesting. With few exceptions Yo, Peter, of tribes I hope you like did. the Ongut who showed their loyalty, Chinggis Khan dissolved the old tribal organization and mm -hmm. reformed the Mongol tribes into these decimal units for social organization. As new nomadic tribes were added to his empire, Chinggis was able to likewise integrate their warriors among these units. All new recruits of this system were held to the same rigid standards of discipline set out by Chinggis Khan, mm -hmm. mandating strict adherence to the orders of the commander. Non-Mongol nomads even had to shave their heads in a distinctive Mongol hairstyle. Oh, I didn't realize that. Instead of a confederation of tribes agreeing to follow a single leader, by the time Chinggis Khan began attacking sedentary powers in 1209, he was followed by a host which had assumed the Mongol identity, mm -hmm. a unified single entity. By largely removing the original tribal allegiances and the old tribal chiefs from power, Chinggis ensured all ties of loyalty led directly to him, and that tribal feuding would not be able to tear apart his empire. It's a very smart move doing that, and you can see a lot of historical figures have done the same, sort of uh, dimin diminishing all opposition so that the men could follow him and him only, and also the people and the public. Further, Chinggis Khan extended this decimal system to their families as well. Each unit, from 10 men to 1,000, had its corresponding civilian unit made up of their families, supplying okay. much of the equipment and serving as the new basis for taxation. Okay, that's also very interesting. So that's how it was funded and that's how people were sort of um, supplied as well. Interesting. The base unit of the Mongol decimal system was the Arban, or 10 lightly armoured horse archers, supplying their own bows and horses. The smallest organisational unit it was quite comparable to the similarly sized contubernium of the Roman legions. These I were see, men who had I to see. live, train, hunt and fight together, a unit designed to be self-sufficient and move on its own as necessary. That's so, that's so valuable in long, long campaigns, like having units that can self-sustain and just do what they need to do is just so valuable um, in, in long drawn out campaigns. Carried with these 10 men were their spare horses, tools for repairing equipment and mm -hmm. clothes, cooking utensils and other supplies. Often they travelled with a felt tent, gear or in Turkish yurt, for shelter, as well as goats, sheep or even cattle or camels for hauling a cart with their extra equipment. 
And again, it's just all these little extra details that people don't think about when like going into war and how valuable um, having these little extra things for your men to do. Like having these people um, so easy maneuverable, having them have their tents being able to pop up at any point in time and have themselves to the vision means that their move mobility is just greater than anyone else's as well so again that's just so valuable um and just a lot of people just don't sort of see it hey reese i hope you're doing good as well hope you enjoy the live uh, reaction let's see how it goes the second one so far down to Our voice is going levels. a little bit so the hopefully that sorts itself out intended to be as self-sufficient and mobile as possible so when traveling long distances or designating a meeting point, each unit could move on its own. Mm -hmm. Building on this foundation, Mongol army units could move independently to surround larger, less maneuverable enemy armies. Discipline for the Arban was strict. Should one man within the Arban flee a battle, then the other nine men would be put to death. There you go. That's what I said earlier. With the intention that strong bonds of loyalty would build between them, mm. such a threat was a burden few were willing to bear. More important than draconian punishment was reward. Men could be expected to be rewarded for meritorious service. One of Chinggis Khan's promulgations was to forbid looting until after the battle was won. Only then would all the loot be collected, tallied and distributed among the soldiers. This ensured the army would not break down into men scrambling for loot and allow okay. the army to escape, and that every soldier could now earn a share for his service. So it meant that it wasn't a sort of uh, as much of a frenzy um, for who can grab what and the first people to grab, grab it, uh, like obviously more, more uh, get more value. Um, he made it more equal, which was very interesting. Further, the widows and children of fallen soldiers were cared for as well. From his own difficult childhood, Chinggis Khan knew what such yeah, a logistics is absolutely by everything the abandonment of families. By keeping soldiers content with the knowledge their families would be protected, Chinggis Khan prevented the societal infighting that could tear his union apart and reduce the effectiveness of his armies. I also remember hearing that in some other uh, videos, the fact that um, fallen soldiers were well paid off. It was a very good, like I just thought it was a good thing, but the way they sort of portrayed it here, which kept them loyal um, and kept the kingdom and the, the empire stable, I didn't think of it from that point of view. So that's a very good point he brings up there. Um, yeah, it made me think a little. Instilled the fierce Mongol discipline and loyalty to their commanders noted by all of the medieval authors who encountered them. Ten Arbans formed a Jagan, 100 men. Ten of these formed a Mingan, or 1,000 men, and ten Mingans formed the most famous unit, the Two Men, 10,000 men. Yep. While the Two Men is more well known, the Mingan was the more important and common in terms of administration and command. Okay, I see. When Chinggis Khan declared the Mongol Empire in 1206, the secret history of the Mongols, the chronicle written for the imperial family after his death, that's very interesting. Informs us of 95 Mingans, and who was assigned to command each of them. The numbers of each Mingan were only nominally 1,000. Some mm -hmm. would be greater and some lesser due to the realities of battlefield losses or incorporation of new tribes. Makes sense. Nonetheless, it allows us to estimate the Mongol army in 1206 had about 95,000 men, soon enlarged with the submission of neighboring tribes over the following years. Mm -hmm. Based off this number, assuming a ratio of warriors to the general population of 1 to 4 or 1 to 5, the population of the region has been estimated at around 600 to 800,000 people. Such a large population back in those days. With higher estimates of 1 million. Similar figures for the region at the beginning of the 20th century. No See what I mean? Similar figures for the 20th century. Compared to back then, with the lack of medical care that we had in the 20th century, that's crazy. Nomadic like, I know, but it was just for their area, but still, like, like that population for their kingdom back in those times was absolutely massive. ...societies did not distinguish between warriors and civilians. All men between the ages of 15 to 60 could be called up for war, 
and since all nomads learned to ride a horse and shoot a bow, each had the skills for war. Compared to sedentary societies in China, Europe and the Islamic world, a far greater portion of the male population could be considered warriors and called up for battle. Once again, just so valuable having that built into you from such a young age, being able to um, fight, ride a horse the way that they did, just having it installed in you from such a young age is just so valuable. This is how the comparatively small population of Mongolia could raise armies large enough to combat the great strength of the Jurchen Jin dynasty. Each division was given considerable freedom in how they achieved their goals. Okay, very Aside interesting. from setting the target and the timeline to accomplish the task, interference from higher command was minimal. Numerous Mongol commanders consistently operated independently from the Great Khan, separated at times by thousands of kilometers. That, that there is, is one of the biggest assets I can think of. Like we go back to the Napoleon reactions and one of the things that you sort of got picked up was unless Napoleon was there dealing with the situation directly, um, it, it, it wasn't going great. Whereas uh, Genghis or Chinggis in this uh, situation has so many other reliable um, leaders and generals to be able to act independently, which just meant that he didn't have to worry about those er uh, areas, could just give him the task and knew the task was going to get done. That being able to basically expand on multiple fronts without being in that Pacific region is just massively valuable, massively valuable. In the early 1220s, picked generals like Jebe and Subutai in the Western Steppe and Mukali in Northern China campaigned independently of Chinggis Khan at that time conquering the Khwarezmian Empire. Unlike Timur, who never let a campaign be led by anyone but himself, the uh, military system of the great Khans allowed them to place complete sense. trust in their commanders, who routinely led armies across the continent and returned without hint of seeking independence. Mm -hmm. The Mongol High Command was a flexible and very experienced body. The men chosen to lead the imperial armies at the beginning of the conquests had fought alongside Chinggis Khan for years, joining him when he was a minor warlord and sticking beside him throughout his early trials. So that means that they were all loyal to him as well, which again once is so valuable. He had that brotherhood of his uh, men around him, so he wanted to enforce that in the men below him, maybe. Maybe you could uh, make that argument? That's how I see it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Also, the fact that the, um, like it said in the video, that the um, other commanders didn't try and take power for themselves, um, which they could have all even tried to carve out a region that they had successfully captured for the empire. Um, but yeah, are we all good. We all good. Sweet. All right. Their loyalty, but their ability. Their background on the steppe hierarchy was diverse some his distant relations, some members of the original steppe aristocracy, while others were simple herders who had shown military ability or aided the Khan. Their elevation and position relied on the Khan's continued favour, making them utterly loyal to him. Mm -hmm. With the declaration of the Mongol Empire in 1206, perhaps the most important institution of the Mongolian military was the Keshik, the imperial bodyguard. Oh, very Established interesting. in 1204 and carrying over many members of the Nukurd, the Kashyyyk was expanded to 10,000 men in 1206. Made up of younger sons and brothers of the commanders of 10, 1,000 and 10,000, sons of subject rulers and worthy commoners, the Kashyyyk served as the Khan's bodyguard, elite units, royal household and much of the imperial administration. The Keshik oh, they also operated as the imperial um, administration. That's interesting as well. ...was divided into three main groups. 8,000 Terekut, who protected the Khan during the day. 1,000 quiver bearers, Korchi, the only men who could wear arrow quivers in the presence of the Khan. Mm. And an elite unit of 1,000 called Kepta Ud, who guarded the Khan at night, and only fought on the battlefield if the Khan himself was present. Very interesting. 
Within the Day Guard was a further thousand-man unit of Braves, or Bahadurs in Mongolian, who formed the heavily armoured vanguard of the Keshik. Discipline was strict. No one approached the Khan's person without first being searched and vetted by the Keshik. All Keshik commanders outranked commanders of equivalent-sized units in the regular army. That's interesting that I outranked all the other uh, commanders. The Keshik also served as a military college. The young men brought into the Keshik learned the ropes of command and the Small. necessities of strategy, tactics, logistics mm. and training so they could be appointed to lead Mingans and armies. Many a well-known Mongol general had earned his position through meritorious service in the Keshik, such as Chomakun, Baiju, Kitbuka and Subutai. That's very interesting as well. That's very interesting because once again, it just shows you how valuable um, educated people are, educated in the subject that you want them to be in. So in this case, war and tactics, educating someone in those uh, fields just is so valuable later on in life. And it's just, it's just so, it's just worth doing. And it shows here. Karachai Noyan, the successor of Timur, served in the Keshik of Chinggis Khan and later his son Chegatai. Aside oh, from the purely okay. military role, the Keshik also acted as the closest I hope we find out a bit more about that guy as well. servants of the Khan. Numerous officers of the Keshik are named, the Khan's elite bodyguards also maintaining his personal herds, equipment, weapons, clothing, camp and musical instruments, organizing hunts and preparing his meals. One office was specifically for the collection of items and animals left behind when the imperial camp moved, while oh. another was for holding a parasol over the Khan. <laughs> the Keshik also served as the most important administrators of the empire, with the chief judges, military leaders and governors and confidants of the Khan being members of the Keshik, ministers, judges of state, as well as head of the imperial guard. Due to its close proximity to the Khan and the lead princes of the empire, it was therefore a highly prestigious and valuable position to gain. As the Keshik was made up of sons of commanders and vassal lords, they were invariably hostages to ensure the loyalty of their families. I didn't think of it in that way. So yes, they got knowledge, yes, they got training, and yes, they were valuable and they could be appointed to positions later but i didn't think from the aspect that they are also considered they could be considered vassals and hostages hmm yeah that's that's a very interesting point that's good that makes me think a bit more about that that sort of uh situation those of foreign royalty when they returned to their homeland were expected to serve as loyal servants of the Khan upholding his rule. Richly rewarded and their positions hereditary, the Keshik was a reliable and powerful arm of the Great Khan's military and government. At the highest level, the Mongol army was organized into wings, associated with directions within Mongolia. The army of the left wing of Eastern Mongolia, Junka, was organized into wings. Thanks for being patient with, with me, guys. Within Mongolia. The army of the left wing of Eastern Mongolia, Junka, the army of the right wing in Western Mongolia, Baraunka, and the army of the center, the Imperial Ordu, which the Keshik and the Khan's personal troops were associated with. Okay. The heads of each of these divisions were the closest, most trusted followers of Chinggis Khan. Together, these formed the Mongolian regular army. Under this system, there was a dual level of elites, the Altan Uruk, the family and descendants of Chinggis Khan, and the Karachu, the Noyans, commanders, appointed often from humble beginnings to lead armies. All right. Working alongside the regular army was the Tama. So what benefits did those elites get? That's what I'm sort of wondering. Um, was there many benefits for being one of those elite? Obviously, I know a descendant of Chinggis, there would be a lot of bonuses and a lot of benefits to that. But for the other side, were there many benefits? And if so, what were they? First mentioned during the reign of Ogadai, the Tama was something of an occupation force, made up of a large percentage of non-Mongol troops and officers, and generally drawn from the various Mingans, it was often commanded by a member of the Keshik called a Tamachi. 
The Tama was That's placed on the frontiers of the Mongol Empire, a largely cavalry force which would situate itself in the best available pasture. They were a consolidating force which would move with the frontier as the empire expanded, unlike ah. the great invasions which saw the Mongols rapidly pass through a region and depart. The Tama was intended to spend years in the region and, if necessary, set up permanently. Okay, I never knew that. So they sort of, these were the ones were that they didn't necessarily have to put all their full force into, so they, they took their time and slowly took land piece by piece. That's very interesting because I never thought that was the case. Um, so just sort of hearing that side of things, very, very interesting. Acting as temporary military governors, behind the advance of the Tama, the permanent civilian administration would be established, and the region thus fully incorporated into the Mongol Empire. Crushing what remained of local resistance, the Tama raided, extorted, and subjugated the independent powers on the empire's borders. One Tamachi, Chomakan, completed the subjugation of the former Khwarezmian territory, Iran, and into the Caucasus during his deployment. Really? Since the Mongols did not rebuild the fortifications they destroyed, the Tama also acted as the Empire's border guard. That's interesting as well. Yeah, because of course they, they, uh, they, of course the Mongols didn't, they lived a nomadic life, so they didn't really want to sort of, uh, rebuild and spend their income on the, uh, the expenses to rebuild those fortifications. Desolating and patrolling the borders as necessary to protect the empire from attack. The Tama comprised two main forces, the main body situated in several camps in the pasture, and an advance force of scouts posted closer to cities and between the camps called Al Ginchi. As the empire expanded, greater numbers of sedentary peoples were incorporated into the military. These roles could be shockingly inhumane, such uh, as the Hesha. The Hesha, so called in the Persian sources, was a forced levy of local peoples driven before the Mongols as living shields against enemy arrows to push siege equipment and to fill in enemy moats with dirt or their own bodies. Holy shite! Oh my! So I knew that they were used to be forced in front of uh, in front of the army, in front of siege weapons, and so on and so forth. I knew all of that, but using them to fill in the enemy moats with dirt and bodies—that is absolutely disgusting. This was particularly common in Chinggis Khan's campaigns in North China and against the Khwarezmian Empire. Holy Yet the shit. Mongols also learned relatively quickly that sedentary peoples could provide knowledge, military roles, and manpower the Mongols themselves lacked. It was that knowledge that they also really, really, really needed. It was most notably in the form of Chinese siege engineers, but within a few years of the invasion of the Jurchen Jin, more Han Chinese were fighting for the Mongols than there were Mongols fighting in North China. That's interesting. There was more Han Chinese fighting in the north than there were more Mongols fighting in North China for the Mongol army. That's a very interesting fact to know. I didn't know that at all. Likewise, as the Mongols expanded westwards, subject peoples served them in a variety of supplementary roles. The Mongols, primarily lightly armoured horse archers, were more than happy to allow their subjects to take on more vulnerable positions on the battlefield. These mm -hmm. same groups also served the Mongols in other roles, especially as labour or manning local garrisons. These local forces, the Cherik, are what Mongolian regional governors had to rely upon to put down local uprisings, as Mongol horsemen were utilised for the expansion of the empire. That also makes sense. You would have to, if you're dealing with a local uprising, you would have to use your local population to deal with it. So that is a very interesting um, fact. Uh, once again. Sedentary kingdoms not destroyed in the initial invasions had to provide their own armies and commanders to serve alongside and under the Mongols, such as the Tangut Kingdom and Armenian Cilicia. That's also very interesting. So you have to provide men as well as uh, taxes and so on and so forth. While continuing to fight in their traditional manner, 
and not directly incorporated into the Mongol army, they had to follow the commands of a Mongolian general. Once again, that's interesting. So they weren't fully incorporated into the army. So they were more like mercenaries that had to follow the commands of the Mongolian generals. So that is very interesting. We will discuss the importance of these non-Mongolian troops in a future video in this series. So make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. You know I am subscribed, I hope you guys are as well. If you haven't already, head over to their page and subscribe. That link will be in the original reaction down below. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. I'm really enjoying the Mongol um, series. Should we do another one of these?